<clears throat> All right, class. So we're here live lecture 24 minutes late. Uh, I'm going to try to see if I can text people. Let's see. All right, we got one person. Oh, man. All right, so we're here live. Sorry about the technical difficulty. So whoever is online, um, you'll get to see the lecture live and everyone else maybe get to um, get to see it uh, recorded, but uh, welcome. So if you can see on the board, I got a whiteboard here attached to my, my uh, shelter in place location here. Uh, it's actually kind of cool. Uh, this is our, uh, this is actually my daughter's, uh, um, I guess, studio. It's in the back of back of my house, and just wanted to show you. Uh, it's still daylight outside, so that's kind of what what's going on outside in my backyard. And uh, and this is kind of where I do my work. It's my workstation here next to these these beat up windows, but there's a desk right there, and. I have a, put a whiteboard here. Now, this is kind of cool. I uh, we're gonna get reflection from the, from the lights here, but we'll try to deal with that. So, all right, we got five people. I um, apologize for those that, that came in a little later. Uh, I don't know what happened to my software. I just couldn't live stream. And so I had to turn off the computer finally and turn it back on. It took 25 minutes or so. So, all right, we're getting people chiming in. That's good. Um, all right. Let me see. So maybe we should just get started. Uh, I'm going to be writing on the board a little bit uh, before I get get going on this um, on the lecture today. So today's lecture, uh, we're going to be talking about creeping flows. All right. So creeping flows is actually uh, it's it's chapter ten dash three. Now you may notice that. We've been covering chapter 10 a lot. Actually, if you look back through the course, we've only really covered chapters, just maybe about a handful of chapters. So the difference here is that we're trying to focus in on the important stuff, right? Uh, we're not just covering the whole book. Um, usually, what the, that's what the bachelor's program is, is it goes in and you go and you spend kind of a week on every chapter, maybe go through 15 chapters. And... Um, and so we're not doing that. We're actually been only focusing about maybe four or five chapters in, in the book. And so, um, all right, John. Um, so first of all, before I get started, good to good to have you guys on board. Um, let's see. So hopefully you guys, I know you guys got all your exams back and hopefully you guys are, are happy with your results. You guys did pretty good. Um, so let me just put this on record now. Let's have a discussion about the final. All right, so um, I'm gonna put, put this on beach board so that everyone knows what's going on. So, so we have, after today, we only have two more lectures, right? So we got one more week uh, and then we got, so after, after this week, we got basically next, next Thursday is like our last, um, you know, guest like week that I consider a week. I usually consider the week before finals is dead week and that's kind of a week where you're just kind of cranking out your projects getting ready for finals and, and things like that so so really after today there's really only one more lecture and so i wanted to talk about the final so now we got 12 people on board usually we max out around 15 12 no actually about 12 to 15. so um what i would like to do and i'm putting this on record is i just um I just assigned homework for chapter 10-3, uh, Creeping Flows, all right? So you guys must have seen it. And that's due, uh, it's due next week. So if I had to guess what day of the week, I think it's the 30th, if I'm not mistaken, that it's due. Yeah, I think I have it due on the 30th at due um, 4, 3, 3. And I think I had it due at midnight. 
All right. So what I'd like to do is I would like to uh, this and tomorrow's homework. The uh, some of you guys might have already turned in the homework. Um, good. Oh, the twenty ninth. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Guillermo. So it's the twenty ninth. It's due at midnight. What I'd like to do is make this the final. All right. So this is the actual this and the homework that's due tonight at midnight. I want that to be that those those problem those three there three homework problems. I think there's three homework problems on that set and maybe another three here. I want that to be the final. All right. So I'm going to try to explain it on on Beachboard. But what I'd like you to do is have that ready, have that turned in by the last day of instruction. Okay, so the last day of instruction is not next week, but like in two weeks. So then you basically have two weeks to do this homework. The other homework you probably already did, it's to actually do tonight. That's, so this is actually homework, uh, this is homework, this should be number eight. I just assigned it last night, all right, so. We're going to do homework eight and we're going to do homework seven, which I think is due today. So that plus that equals final exam. I know you're not going to get it from just by looking at this, but those two sets I want to basically consider that the final because those are the two sections that we had left. Um, uh, one, I forgot the last homework set. I think we're, we're dealing with, uh, Oh, you know, heat transfer, but um, but this last one is de dealing with creeping flow. So those two homework sets, I like to do those as the final, and uh, that way you guys can concentrate on your your um, your projects. Okay, so this again, these homework sets, I'm gonna I'll explain this on Beachboard. This is gonna be your final exam, um, and I want them turned in on the last day of instruction, which is not next week, but the week after that. Okay, and then that way you can turn in your your um, you can turn in your your projects on the day of the final, and so I'll have them due by the day of the final. All right, okay. Are we good on that, everyone? Anyone want to comment on that, or John, Guillermo? Anyone? You guys good with that? With uh, with doing it that way, having a final, basically do this homework set as your final. Okay, I'll I'll take that as a yes. And let's uh, let's go ahead. All right, cool. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so. Uh, but in your case, John, for your qualification, um, let's talk about that. Okay. Your uh, you know your uh, your comprehensive. Okay. So not to put you on the spot, but uh, give me a let, let's let's talk about that. Um, all right, Sam. Thank you. And um, you know we'll we'll, we'll arrange something kind of cool. All right. Okay, so let me get st started on this lecture. All right. Yeah, no, that's that's cool. So yeah, just uh, we uh, we already talked, John, so we're good. Um, but we'll have a discussion. Maybe we can talk. Um, but it, you know, actually, because I need to. In your case, I need to kind of in integrate other stuff. So um, anyway, we'll we'll talk about that later. This might be just part of it. Okay, so the homework, thanks, uh, Preston. So homework seven, right, so that one's due, yeah, it's due the, the when is it due? It says it's due the 26th. Okay, so again, let me let me explain um, what I'm going to do is that homework seven and homework eight, I'm going to make them due in two weeks, and I'm going to title it uh, the final. All right, so that's, I mean, basically, that's what I'm going to do anyway for the final exam. I would give you problems right out of the book just to kind of be fair. And um, and so those are selected problems from the last two subjects that weren't covered by the exam two. So uh, those I'm gonna group together. Homework six, homework seven, homework eight. They're gonna be grouped, be called the final. So again, look for Beachboard on that. They're gonna be both due in two weeks. If you did turn in homework seven already in Dropbox, that's fine. Then, then you don't have to turn that one in anymore. If you didn't turn it in, you got you can. I'm gonna want seven and eight. I'm gonna. I'm gonna grade. Give you a final grade for that, or give you know two weeks. Okay. All right. So whoever already turned in their homework, you're, you guys are fine. You guys are covered. Um, those of you that haven't, then we're gonna go ahead and uh, you know 
and give you two weeks. All right, so let's go ahead, let's get started. All right, so this, uh, this is kind of cool, this whiteboard, I got it from Home Depot. It was only $15 and all it is, it's, uh, it's basically for those people that want to put up, you know, put up paneling on their walls and don't want to paint, you know, you want to kind of put some nice white paneling, that's, that's what it is. So actually for those of you guys that are all into engineering, and you guys, you grad students, you might want to put this in your room. I think this is kind of cool. It's only 15 bucks and you can make your whole wall a white, a whiteboard, you know? So, uh, yeah, you'll be, uh, extra geeky if you do that, but you know, I think it's kind of cool. I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, leaving it, you know, and just, uh, you can project on it and, and do different things with it. So, okay. So let's talk about, so I apologize if you guys uh, chime in on the chat, I'll be checking it but I might be having my back turned a little bit. So we're gonna do about a 20 to 30 minute lecture and it's gonna be recorded. So don't worry about if you if you have to cut out. Um, I'm, again, for those of you guys that came late, I'm really sorry about the late start. Uh, I've been having computer problems. Uh, and so the only way I was able to resolve it is basically turn off the computer and turn it back on, which I should have done from the beginning. Um, it wasn't letting me, giving me access to my camera and all kinds of technical difficulties. So, all right, so um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Creeping flows. Let's see. All right, and so the only thing you really got to con consider with creeping flows is is that uh, we're talking mic uh, uh, length scales that are really small. Okay, and uh, let me write up the uh, Navier-Stokes equations. So you guys remember Navier Stokes, we had um, we had the equations that look like this. Let me see. All right, and so uh, here we have Navier-Stokes equations, okay? And so um, there's, what you need to know for creeping flows is what the context of the Navier-Stokes tell us. So as through the equation signs, there's gotta be a balance, right? That's what usually we mean when we equate something like this. There's gonna be, these conditions have to balance these conditions. And for uh, this first term here is what we call the unsteady term, all right? Because it's a DT at the bottom. So basically it deals with uh, with transient. So if the problem and if the fluidic problem has some kind of a time constant that shifts quickly, then this part's going to be big. All right. So uh, this part here is the uh, is the inertia terms. So think about mass times velocity. Think, so, think about momentum. Think, so, think about um, those kinds of dominant forces. Right. So this is very uh, this is kind of very prevalent in a lot of the fluid dynamic problems that we do. Uh, that we're familiar with, with water flow through through tubes and through things that we can measure um, at macro scales. This is the pressure term, right? And then this here is the gravity term. So body forces, gravitation, buoyancy, that kind of thing. And this last part is the viscous term. Now, uh, do you remember at the beginning of the semester we were doing inviscid flow? So that basically went to zero because we assumed that the viscosity here, the mu term was zero. All right, so creeping flow is opposite of that. Now, we, uh, this is actually a dominant part of creeping flow and uh, as well as the pressure delta. All right, again, unsteady term, the inertia term, the pressure term, the gravity term, and the viscosity, and they all have to balance, right? There's, if one goes up, one has to go down somewhere in order to create a balance. And uh, again, I don't wanna belabor, belabor the point, but this is uh, all com computational fluid dynamic pro uh, pro programs use this, but of course they, they don't do it anal analytically, this is all numerical, right? And so these are, um, but this, this whole balance is always looked at. Okay, so now um, for creeping flow, now, I, I need to put a little bit of context here. I'm just gonna tell you right now, these, uh, this and this are negligible. 
which means they uh, they're so there there is no uh, unsteady. So think about again, think about very small items, very small things flowing in a very viscous fluid. Actually, don't even have to think of viscous as viscosity. We'll talk about uh, the terminology of viscosity, but just think think of things that are very small scale. So even water is highly viscous to something that's really small. So if you look at, like we talk about um, if we, bacteria, viruses, things that are really small will, will move in, in liquid, which we're, we consider liquid to be not that viscous, but to, you know, at the small scale lengths, they're basically dominated by the viscous forces. So these are negligible. Um, gravity is negligible when you're really small. So uh, small, I'm just gonna say small. Small things in fluids. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see that with the, the, the glaring light, sorry about that. Um, maybe if I angle it, you know, all right. I'm gonna, instead of messing with the camera, I'm just gonna basically, yeah, you can kind of get the, the idea there. So, um, so that's what we're dealing with. Now I'm gonna go ahead and erase this and, and start writing some more things. All right, so let's think, okay. So in order to look at the, let's look, look at the Navier-Stokes normalized or uh, the normalized Navier-Stokes equations, right? And so in order to, um, so the equations that I had up previously, to normalize them, we basically start grabbing all our variables and start normalizing them. So make, getting the, um, basically getting the units out so that things aren't basically determined by, um, units aren't a function. So for example, let's say time, Time is measured in seconds, right? So we're gonna replace, we're gonna, the star means normalized. Instead of saying time, we're gonna get a frequency and multiply by time. So we know frequency is one over S, one over time, right? And then um, time is, is, so if we're F is sec, one over seconds, time is seconds, uh, T star is now normalized. We do that with all our variables. For our length variable, we basically get X, and we divide it by a certain characteristic length. All right. And then we get V kind of along the same lines. And we get, we divide our V by some kind of characteristic V. And so um, what do I mean by characteristic? So you guys remember when we're looking at flow through a pipe, the, the velocity of the fluid is, is constant, right? And then it goes or flow, flow over a plate. Then you have start having a, a a, um, a distribution of velocity, no slip at the surface of the plate. And then it gradually the boundary layer has us going from no slip at the plate to a maximum or uniform velocity, right? This, so this would probably be the uniform velocity. And so that allows you now to normalize velocity. And you can do the same thing with all your variables. Pressure, the way we normalize pressure is we basically compare it to pressure at some infinite point and pressure at some, uh, local point. So you get your pressure term minus pressure infinity minus, minus a local pressure. It's almost like a pressure, like a percentage pressure is the way we, we deal with pressure. But anyway, that normalizes pressure. It gets the units out of it. Gravity, same thing. You get, you divide gravity by some kind of a, a gravity constant or some, some constant, right? So in our case, we don't have a changing gravity field, but if we did go up and into outer space, we'd want to use our, our local ground ground gravity <clears throat> and divide or whatever gravity we see up above by this term. And now we we normalize gravity. And then finally, um, we normalize our gradient term. Now this one is is interesting. How do you normalize a gradient term? Well, it turns out that, um, I wonder if we can, if I can turn a little bit towards the end here and see if you guys can see what I'm writing. To uh, normalize a gradient term, so the gradient is basically, is the change of X, change of Y, change of Z. 
right? And so, well, we if we want to normalize that, I mean, x is x, y, and z are dimensions, right? They're linear dimensions. So what we want to do is we want to do a linear. So d, and instead of uh, x, we put x over l. That's how we normalize our x term. But in order to have x over l, we need a we're going to have l at the denominator here hanging. So we actually have to multiply by l. So I apologize if you guys can't see this clearly. So I'm going to say y over l and d z over l. So then we multiply by l at every indice there. And so the the uh, the result is that we have we have a term called one over l that we have to multiply by our grad term. Right, which this is equal to um, one over L times our unitless grad, grad term. So this basically gives us this here. And so that's how we normalize a gradient. All right, so why are we doing all this? The, the point of doing all this, and I'm gonna go ahead and, and move us over a little bit is to, all right, the point of doing all this is to basically normalize our neighbor Stokes. And so um, when we go ahead and put in all these non-dimensional terms, we're basically normalizing our neighbor Stokes. And so let, me, let me explain. So uh, what happens is when we have uh, dv star dt, when we pop in our normalized velocity, we have these precipitates that come out, right? It's these terms associated with the non-dimensional terms that come out that we need to multiply with. So what, it, what ends up happening is we have a force times L divided by V. That's on the uh, unsteady term. And then for the, um, and then, uh, yeah, for the um, momentum term, we get nothing comes out of that one. So that's dot. like this, and I'm gonna have to start erasing these here so we don't run into them. All right, so again, we're writing the, so again, we're writing the neighbor Stokes, uh, non-dimensionalized neighbor Stokes, and then what, what precipitates out of the pressure term is PO minus P infinity, rho V squared, okay? So when we define the uh, normalized pressure, this comes out. When we uh, when we set up the neighbor Stokes times p normalized plus our gravity term, the what comes out of that is gl, let's see gl over v squared times our normalized gravity term. I'm gonna have to erase this part. And then finally, we have one more term after that. We have our viscous term, which becomes mu over rho VL times our normalized gradient squared V um, times V normalized. Okay, so these are, this is our normalized neighbor Stokes. And now uh, I know that you know what this is, right? You guys know what that is, right? That's one over R, right? Run over one over Reynolds, Reynolds number. So, and then you might re, um, recognize some of the other terms, but basically now we can start substituting in our normalized uh, numbers here. So we have, for example, we have, for example, we have the Stroud number is equal to F L over V. Now these are numbers that are, um, we know what we recognize the Reynolds number and it tells us when the inertial forces, it's basically a ratio of the inertial forces over the viscous forces. And when the Reynolds number is high, it means the inertial forces are actually dominant. So all these numbers have that kind of same um, thing going on here. This basically is, is a frequency term over the velocity. So if something has a high transient component, right, it's gonna be dominant there. So this number may be large, right? And so we know that this is actually this, this number here. 
Then we have the Euler number, which is a pressure term, which is PO minus P infinity divided by rho V squared. So it's more of a pressure over, over the, the, uh, the velocity dominated pressure. And um, so the Euler, the Euler term, actually, where does the Euler term go? Is right here, right? So we see that there. And then we have, um, what do we have left? We have the Froude number, the Froude number squared is basically, it's a gravity, it's a gravity term, V squared G uh, over L. And that goes here, right? It's basically, uh, it's actually uh, one over. Um, and then finally we got the Reynolds number, which is equal to rho VL over mu. And this clearly is basically the one over the Reynolds number. So um, when we deal with, now going back to creep flows, I had mentioned that our momentum turn disappear. Uh, our, that's because, um, Velocities are really small, and um, these go away, and so does our transient term. That goes away, and so uh, so does our gravity term. That's because the Froude number basically starts there. Basically, it's gravity. Uh, how much influence does gravity have? And when things are really small, and they're in, a, in, the, in the viscosity terms dominate, then the the gravity part, you know, the body force basically is negligible. And all you're left is basically with the viscous term and the pressure term. And so basically what that means is, and you can go ahead and rewind this video later. Uh, I'm gonna have to erase. Maybe I'll erase over here. So this means that um, all this, when everything cancels out, you're left with, I'll turn this so you guys can see it. You're left with the Euler number. Dot P non-dimensional is equal to one over the Reynolds number. V star squared, V star. Okay, so neighbor Stokes boils down to that. All right, and then even the, even within that, um, what what ends up happening is in order for this term to balance that term, then we need to have uh, we need we need to have the Euler number pretty much equal equal to one over the Reynolds number. And for that to happen, we have to have PO, P infinity, basically a, the pressure difference. Whatever's driving, the, whatever's driving the flow, that pressure, that pressure delta divided by rho V squared is equal to mu over uh, rho V length. Okay, so then you look, you notice something here is our densities drop off. And so basically creep flows, that's where the density actually factors out, Denser, density is no longer a, uh, an issue anymore um, at those at those microscopic levels and things are, for example, an, an amoeba going through water, the density of that, how heavy that is, is negligible. So then it becomes this, and therefore you get something where basically the pressure difference that drives the, the, the flow is equivalent to uh, the viscosity times velocity divided by L. So in other words, in, the, in order the, the uh, so the pressure is dominant, you have to have enough pressure in order to get something to flow. That's what it's saying. Because in these, uh, again, in these flow regimes, basically they're so small that the viscosity terms dominate. And then, um, all right. So let's go ahead and erase this. If you guys have any questions, I'm looking at the uh, live stream here. You can go ahead and let me know. I'm going to go ahead and erase what we have here and then tail it into the final part of our discussion here. All right, so um, let me have, let me 
describe a little bit what's going on here. So, um, so the again, these flows we're used to. Uh, let's look at a person swimming. All right. So we got a person that's swimming, and here I am going to draw, draw horrible there. I used to be a better, better drawing person there. So this this guy's swimming. All right, going in that direction. Let's assume this person is two meters in length. All right, and let's assume um, they're going one meter per second. All right, so what is the Reynolds number associated with that person swimming? Well, um, let's look at the Reynolds number for that. The length of this person is equal to two meters. The velocity, I'm sorry, did I say two meters? Yeah, the velocity is one meter per second. Um, the, the length velocity, the density is a thousand kilograms per meter cube. That's the density of the, of the water, right? So this person's swimming in water. And then the viscosity, uh, we have here as 0 0.001 Pascal seconds. So then if we're going to go ahead and do the uh, the calculation here, so we're going to say uh, velocity is one meter per second, length is two meters, divide by 0 0.001 PAS. Um, Right, so this is equal to two times 10 to the six. Two times 10 to the six, all right? Two million feet. It doesn't even have to be that. Um, I wish I had a, a, a goodie to give you guys. I probably won't even see you guys in person until who knows when, but uh, yeah, so the, the short answer, it's basically two, uh, uh, Reynolds number two million is by far turbulent flow. And so these Reynolds numbers at this, at this level, the flow is, is inertial dominated, inertia dominated. So what happens is, think about when you swim, right? There's, you take a, a stroke and you coast and you take another stroke and you coast and you're doing that, right? So there's that coasting is the inertia, the inertia actually carries you. All right, so well, let's look at um, let's look at a bacteria, for example. So if we did if we did a Reynolds number for a bacteria, now I was tempted on putting the instead of a bacteria, a COVID nineteen molecule, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip on that. Use that to propel themselves in the liquid because what's what's happening is at these scales. So we're talking for this one here, um, at this scale right here, we're gonna call this, this distance here, uh, 125 micrometers. So at these small scales, uh, water be behaves like if, like us swimming in, in honey, or actually thicker, all right? And so there is no longer this ability to coast because inertial force, it, our inertial forces are now negligible. So there is this first, this thing isn't gonna be able to just swim and coast, right? It's kind of like a tractor, right? A tractor has to basically have have its always traction and always pulling. It doesn't basically pull and then coast down the street. Um, it's gotta just kind of force itself through this molasses type of material, bacteria at small scales. That's why they have this all these features, the cilias and the flagels to do that. So um, so let's go ahead, uh, Reynolds number of a bacteria. So I'm gonna say, and we're gonna say, uh, we're gonna say the length scale of the bacteria is equal to 125 micrometers. And we're gonna say the, uh, the velocity. So we're gonna say the velocity is basically, they travel really small. So every second they travel their length. So we're gonna say 125 micrometers per second. And then finally, we're going to say the viscosity. Um, um, we're going to, well, we're going to have the same viscosity as water, kilograms per meter cubed, and same viscosity term for water, 0 0.001 Pascal seconds. All right. Hopefully, you guys can see that. All right. So now, when we when we input all that, let me switch over here. One thousand. 
is rho. Um, velocity is 125 micrometers per second. And length scale is 125 micrometers. We divide um, rho VL divided by the uh, by the uh, viscosity, which is 0 0.001 Pascal seconds. Remember what the Pascal is, is Newton per Newton per meter square. So we're not, um, the only thing we don't have here is we have to, we have to convert these micrometers to meters, right? So for that, we have to divide by 10 times 10, um, well, I'm sorry. We got to divide by, by a million, 10 to the six, twice. One for the velocity, one for the, for the L, 10 to the six, right? So it turns out that that, if you just allow me to use my calculator, use my calculator, 1,000, 125, 125 times um, 0.001. For swimming, we would have to swim, so I'm gonna say 0 0.0156, that's our Reynolds number is equal to, um, we use the same viscosity, um, same density. Um, I'm sorry, one meter per second. We're looking at our, at, our, at our thing now here. So one meter per second is our swimming velocity. We are two meters in length. And now uh, what would be the viscosity here? So let's, let's, yeah, let's just do this in mu. All right, so what would be the mu to get this? So uh, the mu would be equal to, so it's, so our viscosity would be 128,000. Um, We'd have to basically swim through roofing tar. Um, and that stuff barely flows, right? I mean, it's so, you imagine? Now, um, I was talking to, uh, so I saw a video, this would have been nice to, uh, to talk about. Um, so there's videos online about people swimming through those, uh, there are these black spheres that are, um, if you guys ever look, there's, they put them inside of lake reservoirs now. There are these black, kind of uh, polymeric kind of, they look like spheres. They're about this big, they're, they're, they're black filled with water. And they, they float them at, at, on the surface of a, of a reservoir, basically a reservoir where we get our, our water. And um, they just basically, they look pretty cool. They look like, um, I don't know, the size of a small melon. And they just completely cover the surface of the reservoir. They float up to the top. And so that's kind of a simulation of high viscosity, right? They swim through these balls. Um, Uh, Preston, you said the video cuts out every 10 seconds or so. Apologize about that. Um, it, I don't know if everyone else has seen that. It could be. It could be that the the the, the streaming service is pretty slow. So um, yeah, I apologize about that, guys. So you guys can go back to the video um, to the recording after the fact. Hopefully, the recording doesn't cut out. Um, I don't think it's. Yeah, everyone's seeing. All right. Um, well, okay. So again, hopefully the. The recording part is is okay, but um, okay. So oh, we're almost done anyway. But um, okay. So oh, we're almost done anyway. Um, and uh, so, anyways, like I was saying, that the uh, if you if you swim some, I guess he said, I'm going to swim through this this stuff. And this was kind of some I don't know some nature show. Uh, so they put a they put a rope on him and he took a dive into this lake that was filled with these floating. It's almost like those balls that that that, that Chuck E. Cheese, you know, the kids jump in. But just imagine those filled with water and put into a into like a small pool. All right. So anyway, that's what creeping flows is. Uh, I think I covered the basics. Um, it has to do with Reynolds number. It has to do with the uh, also. I think there was a section in the in the book about um, volcanic ash. You know, things that are small. Uh, so if you throw a rock into the air and it comes down, 
right? They come down pretty fast because they're dominated by the body force, which is the, the gravity brings it down, and then you have velocity, and eventually you have a terminal velocity. Uh, when things are small and when the air acts as a viscous fluid to, for example, ash, be kind of on the same scale, but in terms of something in the air or even smaller, or to think of pollen, it can float, right? It can actually float like if it was in water and just coast, and it can cover a broad area, and it doesn't, it doesn't behave as a projectile that's dominated by, by body forces, right? It's, it behaves more as, uh, as something swimming through water. For example, a small bacteria somehow being airborne, you know, going through the air is almost like us swimming through water. And so it's, so it's kind of the science, the scales of science kind of change. Right, so you can't treat things as projectiles. You have to treat them with creeping flows. They, they, uh, you have to look at those, uh, you know, at what's dominant. Right, and here it's.